Hello and welcome to the Austin Jazz Society Conversations with the Hall of Fame. My name is Christian Wiggs. I have served as the producer on this series. And as a part of its mission, the Austin Jazz Society recognizes and honors the legacy of those local individuals who have made a positive contribution to the jazz art form. Each year, the Society nominates and selects candidates to be recognized and inducted into the Austin Jazz Society Hall of Fame. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the Society arranged for individual conversations with those living Hall of Famers as a way of capturing their thoughts and influences affecting their love of jazz. We are very thankful to have Rabbi Neil Blumoff, recognized jazz aficionado and historian, conduct these interviews. We hope these interviews will give a sense of commitment, history, contributions, and personal love for America's own art form, jazz. the scene in Austin for over 50 years, I think. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. I got here in the fall of 71. I started UT in the fall of 71. So that's a momentous half century worth of Austin jazz right there, you know? Well, congratulations. And it's a, oh. it's a momentous, God willing, with good health. Yeah, it, 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 it takes just, I, I feel lucky to be here doing it still today. No question. Well, do you want to tell us how you, where you come from, where you got started and how you got here? Well, I, I grew up in Houston, and uh, a particular er, uh, school, really, in Houston that had, you know, starting in elementary school, middle school, high school, very strong program in the city there is, you know, and uh, and I had older brothers and sisters, so like even like five years older than me, I would see, you know, guys who are kind of future music stars and. You know, so kind of idolization, but more than anything, I was hearing all this great music that my older brother and sister were bringing home, all these records, and, you know, you know, loving what I was hearing, and then that kind of led me to make my own discoveries when it was my turn. So, well, so you, uh, you went to school in Houston, and how'd you find your way to Austin? Well, uh, I was, I hear a lot of my buddies from uh, high school were headed to what were clearly um, sort of jazz studies destinations, whether that was Berkeley and Boston or University of North Texas or North Texas State at that time in Denton. And I was I was not so sure. I, I was no question, uh, you know, music and jazz in particular were my big interests, but I hadn't quite decided to commit that way, you know, for various reasons, some of which I had seen such prodigies a few years ahead of me that I thought, well, those guys are the ones who as high school kids are out going on tour around the country with stars and that those are the musician guys. <laughs> but uh, I guess an important uh, change um, was that at that year, I guess I was a senior, junior, I guess I was a junior in high school, the UT Jazz Band uh, came through and sort of played a, a concert for our, you know, our students, our, particularly the jazz students. Some guys were in that band who I'd later come to know very well, but that made me very aware that, oh, in Austin, I could, you know, there's a way I could keep playing jazz until I figured out what I'm going to do, right? Because I was kind of keeping my academic options open and then you know found myself in Austin with right off the bat all kinds of uh, performing opportunities and great guys and great players and uh, just a lot of sort of ground level opportunities and uh, you know so that's that was kind of fortuitous about Austin. Well one might say that if you got here in 1971 you came arguably at the golden age of some of Austin's great music. Well, I mean, the uh, Armadillo World Headquarters had been open for less than a year, and it was some of the very first jazz musicians I met who were telling me about the Armadillo and uh, 
and so you know I got there in short order and heard concerts and you know a lot of people in Austin now have heard of the armadillo and know the lore of it sometimes what they even though you know it's maybe most famous for you know, you know Bruce Springsteen and the Grateful Dead before they were at the peak of their fame you know it was there was music every night and the fantastic thing was besides all of what was the really um, spirit of the times popular music of the day other nights of the month you might hear some group that you have to go to Greenwich Village and on a lucky night to hear them you know I heard Sun Ra at, at the Armadillo World Headquarters and uh, you know Dewey Redman and you know a, a wide range I mean Dexter Gordon and but that was sprinkled in because there were at the top of the Armadillo pyramid there was a, a real jazz lover uh, Hank Ulrich was uh, made sure that some of his favorite music got there so uh, it, was, it was great that's amazing that's a yeah you could have gone up to fort worth to hear dewey redmond at a certain point right well yeah he was around there but at that point you know he wasn't living in fort worth i mean he was sort of in association with kind of the the ornette crowd and of course ornette had been in fort worth at some point but at this time they were new york based artists no matter where they were born you know yeah. Uh, that's, that's where they resided. Uh, a great thing about Austin and the Armadillo in particular in those days, for those of us who were maybe more enthusiastic about uh, jazz than we were particularly skilled at it, <laughs> I was definitely still learning, but we had the opportunity to open for national groups. You know, so if like a you know a touring act, big jazz name would come through, play the Armadillo, it was guaranteed there would be some selected appropriate local band to be the opening act. I mean, this is true for the jazz people like me, but for all across all the genres. So that was a fantastic thing, just for a chance for all of us fledglings to get up there and open to a big crowd for our musical heroes. I mean, that was, well, it, seems, it seems special then. And looking back on it, it's like, wow, what an opportunity. That's for sure. I mean, what a great way of education to be able to sort of learn it while you're doing it. Yeah, the education and just, I mean, and, and, the, and the level of inspiration. I mean, you are opening for them and you're hearing them. You knew you were, you know, light years away in terms of having it together. But that proximity made it somehow more tangible and, you know, some kind of pat on the back or something just to be in that presence. And that was always a special event and at very memorable times anytime I cross paths with any of those kinds of artists you know going back 40 50 years ago it was you know it's it's still vivid to me now it was that much of an inspiration well that's incredible you know they uh, I have a really great indelible memory with the Sun Ra Orchestra I used to work a jazz fest at Jazz and Heritage Festival in New Orleans and oh, yeah? Yeah. drive musicians around and I crashed the van with all those guys in the van oh, oh wow we had a good time. <laughs> yeah, there, there wasn't that big a turnout, but I remember seated out there that, you know, you'd one by one, the audience members would be surrounded by the entire orchestra, or whatever he was calling it at that time. So it was, yeah. it was Sun Ra and the rest of them just surrounding you, like, you know, for 30 seconds or something, giving you a personal concert, you know. Well, space, like space is the place, traveling spaceways. Indeed it is. Now, I know you're a very modest man, but you're a renaissance man, Dr. Mills. And, you know, you're talking about being a fledgling. That's that's amazing. But you've got this amazing quality of being able to to certainly work in the jazz idiom, of course, but you've arranged, you've done classical, you've taught master classes. You know, where does all this come from if you came to Austin at such a tender age? Well, I, I mean, I was always interested in all those things. And, um, you know, I it, and at some point I maybe thought of myself as more of a writer than a player because I think maybe because, I mean, there were already a number of saxophone players in town at a high level. When I got here, there were fewer players who felt uh, ready and equipped to, to write horn arrangements or things like that. And that's something I had been doing uh, from pretty early on. I mean, a lot of this... I mean, just the things I got interested in, I just kind of like today, you know, I just keep doing them and I gradually, gradually, gradually get better at them. Uh, I didn't start off with a plan like today, you know, as a, 
teacher, professor, you know, advice about how, here's the way to get your improvisation skills together, and here's a pattern of study. And you know, I, after all this time, I have it that more organized. I didn't have it at all organized. I, I wasn't trying to prepare a musical career at all. That I was just trying to do the things that were like really interesting to me. And as it turned out, the what spoke to me first was not say memorizing a Coltrane or a Cannonball solo. Would have been a good thing to do, but that for whatever reason, like I said, I didn't have a plan. I was just reacting to what fascinated me, and what fascinated me was the song structure, you know, the Cannonball record, ah, that tune, let me try to find that, those chords on the piano, and, you know, and let me try to put together some, some kind of charts so I kind of, my friends can get together, you know, not at school, but at their house, and try to play through these things that I did my best to transcribe off the record, so somehow that part of it just spoke to me first, and I spent a lot of time uh, just trying to bang them out at the piano and figure them out. And then, you know, that kind of led into writing my own stuff, just because when I couldn't find what I was looking for, trying to replicate a record, it would lead me to something, hey, that sounds pretty good. So I got a little more, I got more practiced at that, just because I spent more time doing it than I did, say, building, you know, bebop skills or something, which is something I work at to this day, but that wasn't the first thing that, uh, got me going. How was Austin a uh, an inspiration for you as you developed your composing voice? Well, uh, I mean, one thing that was that really distinguished Austin in general in those first days, and I was lucky enough to be gigging pretty quickly. You know, like I was a you know freshman first semester. I was still seventeen. I think I played my first gig in Austin, and uh, but. What distinguished it maybe from the scenes in Dallas, in Houston, say, each of which had their great musicians and great little pockets of town that had some real cool things going on. Austin, across the board, was not uh, a, scene, a kind of a situation like some of those maybe at the time more musically prosperous places where good players would get, ah, we've got this hotel lounge gig for two years. You know, really good players, and but that would tend to be the scene. Guys would get lodged into some kind of semi-corporate gig that they'd play really well, but Austin was always more, everybody just plays one-nighters, and you bounce around from club to club, and uh, what went hand in hand was everybody had the freedom to do whatever they wanted, and it was it was an expectation that you were, that every band was going to be doing original music and some kind of bizarre hodgepodge of styles, and um, it, it was just the mindset of the city. I had a lot to do with the university and inheriting, you know, a kind of a center point of the spirit of the '60s, you know, in Austin, and. Um, it encouraged that sort of creativity. So the idea that, um, you know, I, when I started, you know, getting my, the songs I've been writing on paper and have people to play with, play them, uh, I didn't feel like, well, you can't do that. You gotta be playing this song list that you have to play if you want to get a gig. And it's like, no, we just, every band did whatever they felt like it. So there was built in uh, license and almost expectation to do that. So it, it I, you know, I just sort of went wild and uh, was fortunate and ha enough to have like a really good band and willing bandmates that indulged me. <laughs> well, John, that's, that's incredible. And I think in the 50 year career, you know, you have quite a lexicon of, of experiences is that, you know, just for now, and it doesn't have to be authoritative, but is there any um, experience or two that kind of stands out of you performing that you'd want to maybe just uh, think about in this moment? Well, I mean, uh, some of those highlights that come to mind, you know, where I find myself on the bandstand with who at that t time, and maybe still, was my ultimate musical, compositional, musical thinker hero, and that was Joe Zavadul uh, from Cannonball Adderley first, sure. and then, uh, you know, the Miles Davis recordings, and of course, he's the co-founder of Weather Report, which for me and the people of my age right then and there, they, they were the group, you know, it sort of seemed, every time they'd come through town, it wasn't like they were, 
you know, you're playing their hits, it was always some new musical revelation. You know, something that hadn't been recorded yet. And so it was always this flabbergasting, kind of transforming thing. And there was a night, uh, the band that, I, you know, Mike Mordecai was the founder of, and I was writing, I guess, the bulk of the original music for the band. And we, we were playing our regular club night uh, at a little club. It's very enjoyable, but very small club in Houston's Montrose area, and sort of ruining the fact that although we had, it's nice to have a gig that weekend in Houston, two nights, we were missing Weather Report, <laughs> which was like such a prime, you know, thing that it was like, oh, it's kind of painful to be here. We're doing our songs and Weather Report's playing in town. And, you know, lo and behold, it was the third set of that night, and we look up, and in a, in a room that seated about 25 or 30 people, sitting right there on the front was Joe Zavano. And, uh, and he kind of, I could picture it, he kind of hopped across, and we had no real stage, it was kind of like flat floor, but we had kind of like monitors that kind of, you know, delineated our space, and he kind of jumped across the monitors and got behind the keyboard on a tune that I had uh, written, um, totally channeling my idea of the latest weather report. You know, that was 100% what I was going for as I was writing it. Here we were playing that song and Zavanul was had just come out of nowhere onto the stage and was back behind me playing piano. And uh, <laughs> so that was, that's been a long time, nearly 50 years ago, but it's so vivid, and I don't know if that's ever been topped in terms of just that, you know, kind of proximity. I guess, I, you know, I've had some other kinds of experiences where f for one magical night or one magical set or something, here I am playing with unquestionably a musical uh, hero. I mean, m more recently, still going back, you know, maybe close to 20 years, had that situation of uh, subbing in uh, Maria Schneider's group band for for one night, which is in Austin, and one of her replayers had to return to New York City unexpectedly, and so short notice there I was with all those great players playing all that unbelievable music with her about as far away as my computer screen conducting it right in front of me and here I was doing it. And that's, you know, that was one of those um, magical kinds of nights. Uh, anytime I'm thinking about things like that, you know, where you can, you know, a famous name and famous music and a once in a lifetime opportunity, you know, for every one of those on high profile kind of thing, there are so many nights when you're just playing with fantastic players and everything's clicking and you know, it's our Austin people, and it's at some kind of a magical level like that. And that happens all the time. You know, it's like, it's, you know, you tend to name, pick the ones that have to do with some famous person, but there's a ongoing quality of the experience that can happen any night, anytime, anywhere. The everyday holiness of just being with those people and creating the musical community, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and it's... And it's sometimes it happens on, like say, on a third set, and there's not many people there, but there's just this musical connection happens. Maybe everybody's relaxed, and for, for whatever reason, uh, you know, it happens. It, it would be great if we could always just sort of make that happen on command, and that's what we you know, we try to sort of put ourselves in the situations where the likelihood is good. But it, there is a kind of a, uh, you know like the weather or something, you know, you can't make it happen, but some very wonderful things do happen. Oh, and indeed, you know, as, as somebody uh, who's been in Austin 22 years, uh, you know, people always, you know, you always think about the road not traveled. Uh -huh. uh, and you, you've seen generations of students, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me ask you, John, if you don't mind, how do you keep your inspiration high? Well, the has, frankly, the students have a lot to do with, uh, you know, kind of uh, keeping me from ever getting complacent because I've had, you know, a lot of those former students, uh, you know, even when they were students, they had things they could show me, you know, it's always a two way street. And uh, I think kind of a, a teacher's obligation is not only to bring what you do and what you figured out, 
and what you what's your area of specialty, but you you always are want to be prepared to sort of be in some kind of meaningful dialogue with the students, you know. You know, of course, some of those people who are one-time students are now, you know, in their 40s and, you know, have accomplished all kinds of fantastic things. But I think uh, those musicians, even at a young age, uh, have some area of specialty that you've got to admire and respect and try to learn from because, you know, it's such a deep, broad subject uh, somebody who shows up who maybe doesn't even have all their chops anywhere near where they're going to be in a few years, man, they know some music. That, that tends to be a common thread. There's some records they know backwards and forwards. They could hum every solo on that whole record even before they have the wherewithal to play it. They're that deep into it. And anytime that's the case, there's, you know, there's something to be learned from what they know. And uh, it's not uh, you know, it's a it's a. I, I kind of see it as an equal thing, and it kind of certainly keeps me going and keeps me from feeling like okay, I, I figured out everything I need to figure out because you know it, it never stops, which is great a great thing. Well, that's an incredibly humble position to be in, and I, I just well, well it, it's humbling certainly because it, as much as you know, you can kind of. Look, you know, you've got a long, you got more pages in your resume, and you know, you've been doing, you know, but when it comes right down to it, I mean, you know, we're we have a very strong program, and so some, you know, the people that are coming in as, you know, starting their freshman year or coming in for uh, uh, graduate studies in jazz or whatever, that's not just the average random person. They're all super motivated and you know, gifted, and it always takes some kind of combination of, you know, having the work ethic for the for the gift to come forward, you know. I think it's incredible. And, but, you know, would you not agree, John, that uh, the jazz has changed in 50 years? Well, the uh, there, there certainly have been cycles of uh, the nature of, you know, kind of the style of the music, which has gone through some cycles. And I'd say generally, uh, what's been going on in Austin has tended to reflect the tendencies at the national or international level. You know, when I when I was um, first got to Austin, there were some jam sessions where uh, people were playing, like you know, jam sessions and playing standards. You know, James Polk was leading a session like that, and uh, there's some other sessions around town. But probably the biggest energy were from these spin-offs of Electric Miles Davis. These first records from Chick Corea, Herbie Hancock Headhunters, Weather Report. All these things were just happening, bursting out on the international stage, and it had that impact on me and most of the people who were right at my age. I mean, we played the big bands, we'd, we'd learn tunes, but if you had a band, that's what you would do, and that's what would bring this crowd energy and that was that era, and there have been some eras since of the, uh, say, the Wynton Marsalis influenced years that were kind of going back to a more uh, classic uh, acoustic jazz direction, and there have been, you know, there's been kind of a wave after that of uh, maybe incorporating more world music and jazz, and uh, kind of in a way I kind of hear it as having some aspects of fusion of the world music sensibility, but with very acoustic means. You know, drummers are playing small kits and light sticks, and they're doing all that sort of content that was kind of more of a marker of the fusion era, in my view, mm -hmm. but it has more of an acoustic jazz traditional delivery. So it, it, there have been a lot of changes that way. There have been changes certainly in the... Um, in the uh, you know just the players here in town, and that and this reflects Austin, the size of Austin, and uh, Austin in general, where say in the 70s and then you were traveling to some other town or you're in another airport, you had to exp you had to say Austin, Texas. No, not I didn't say Boston. I said Austin, Texas, and it's the capital. No, it's not Dallas isn't the capital. Austin is actually the capital. No, you used to have to explain it. And then as uh, the Austin City Limits TV show 
reached more you know people on a long term basis, and of course the uh, the uh, South by Southwest festival and things like that. Then you started to get Austin started to get this uh, this reputation that we sort of take for granted now as a kind of a alternative music city, but it wasn't always like that. And so there there was a period when some of the guys maybe just a few years ahead of me, if you got to a certain level in Austin, you were headed to L.A. or New York or in those days maybe. Las Vegas, because there's still a lot of live band work there, maybe Nashville, depending on your direction. But there was a tendency, almost like people were graduating, and they'd move on to a bigger place. And then, I don't know if it's around 1980 or something, it, noticeably, the traffic started to come the other direction. And here's some guy that showed up in town, and he's from L.A. or he's from New York, or he's from Montreal, or wherever it might be, and you started to see people uh, you know, coming here as a destination and not a small market to get out of. So that was kind of an interesting turnaround in the perception of Austin in those years. And, you know, jazz was, you know, sort of reflected the same tendencies. You know, Dr. Mills, that's so great because I was actually going to ask you about a lot of that, that, that uh, movement I was going to ask you about your definition of fusion. I know you have John Mills times 10, and you, it's billed as a fusion band. Well, I, I, I probably never used that word, but, uh, but I think that's still an apt description. You know, uh, ha having lived through that whole, uh, it wasn't even quite a decade that that was really sort of the prominent flavor of jazz. So I always considered it jazz. To me, there was the fact that you know, it had an electric guitar. I mean, Charlie Christian played an electric guitar, <laughs> you know, so pre-bebop, right? So uh, that, the electric, to me, I mean, it's like when you're talking about Miles Davis and you're talking about Joe Zavala and Wayne Shorter, all these guys, this is what they're doing. Are you telling me that's not jazz because they amplified something? Of course it's jazz. It's part of the, you know, improvisation, the harmonic vocabulary. During those, the, maybe from 1970 to say 77 or 78, when it was actually punk it was the next event that sort of wiped that version of jazz off the scene a little bit. But uh, nobody called it fusion. People kind of were re reaching around for what to call it. You know, it's like, oh, is it, well, if we call, you know, do we call Miles Davis jazz rock? If they're, if, if Miles Davis is jazz rock, I thought that's what like, you know, Chicago with their, you know, rock band with the horn section. That seemed like that was jazz rock. What's this other thing? And it was pretty much all done creatively before it started being referred to as fusion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of called fusion in the rear view mirror. And I think sometimes, you know, speaking as somebody who uh, still has a love for that music when it's done at its highest level, uh, it, it kind of had a little bit of a dismissive aspect to it when people started calling it fusion like as though it wasn't really jazz and to me and to this day it obviously is and i uh any because uh, you know just kind of writing from your influences uh you know th those musicians of those times still provided kind of an inspiration and i um it's kind of hard for me to imagine music without them being part of my internal conversation well, it's so valuable to hear because, you know, some purists might say that, you know, by 1967, you're kind of at a different stage in history and Steely Dan and Chicago and all that stuff. So I really appreciate the perspective that you're giving about this incredible uh, development that's still happening. Right. And since I was never really trying to establish this, oh, I'm going to be a jazz musician, I just liked a lot of records. And that included, you know, uh, Art Blakey records and uh you know, Coltrane records, and that included uh, some of these jazz rock groups too. You know, I just found them compelling. It, it was creative. It um, didn't have the, you know, it wasn't packed with two, five, one chord progressions, and it wasn't based on the changes to, you know, a George Gershwin tune or something, but the players playing it were clearly coming out of jazz, and they were mixing things in a way that seem like, you know, the rules only became apparent after the fact, you know, which is kind of the true with, uh, you know, 
bebop. You know, it's not like, you know, it's sort of going off in some directions. And once it's all done, people could go back and say, here are the rules to bebop. But, you know, look at the example of Thelonious Monk. You know, he was of that time and of that creative spirit, but sort of making his own, finding his own pathway. So, you know, I think that's an element that's, as we struggle to find a, a definition of jazz that fits everything we uh, internally just feel like it has to be included in, in jazz. Uh, that's sort of a, a, I think, a kind of a creative spirit. And I th think, you know, whether you're looking at Ellington or, or Charlie Parker or whatever, there's always that element of, well, here's this improvisational language we've inherited and then yet and then here are the times we are living in which nobody else has experienced before the music somehow needs you know it seems natural for it to incorporate the present in some way uh, for jazz for me that's all that was maybe what caught my ear about jazz the most is it always seemed kind of of the moment as I find that, yeah no i find that so insightful and you'll you'll have your uh, entrepreneur of the decade, whether it's Ornette Coleman or Cecil Taylor or Pharaoh Sanders or or uh, or Albert Eiler or whoever it might be. But I love your idea about uh, about it just being responding to the moment when you are living. And I think that that's so important to remember. You know, uh, I, mean, I, I, I get to teach uh, jazz history courses at UT and, you know, those before the people we think of as jazz musicians were even refer referring it to jazz as jazz they were basically playing on ragtime pieces that they brought a certain kind of freewheeling spirit to they're sort of interpreting the popular music of the day and giving it a distinctive spontaneous quality and so i feel like that's the continuity that, that carries over i mean i've had yeah, I, no, I, that's, I think, uh, kind of having eclectic taste is something that's kind of worked in my favor. It's not a calculation for music business purposes. It's just stuff I like, all kind of, uh, I look for a way to respond to it and be a part of it some way. And that's, that's been kind of advantageous. But um, I know, I think sometime, somewhere in the past, somebody who, uh, you know, who I share a lot of musical tastes with, has gotten upset because wow it sounded like that times 10 song had a hip-hop beat like you can't do that you know that's a betrayal of some kind it's like man i didn't even analyze it it just sort of felt like a good groove and i you know you put some chord changes in there and melodic ideas and you play uh open-ended solos over it <laughs> there's there's nothing inherently wrong with any particular beat you know it's sort of like kind of what you what you do with it you know that's so interesting i was going to go in a different direction but since you brought that up i came sort of jazz aware during the heyday of the conversations if you want to call it that between keith jared and winton marcellus about what jazz is and all that do you have any thoughts about any of that well i'd say both of those gentlemen are you know a couple of the greatest musical minds of my lifetime and they're highly opinionated, both of them, and are fully entitled <laughs> to say and think whatever they want because they have earned it, to say the least. You know, I, um, I know at one point, uh, I'll, I'll get on the Keith Jarrett subject first, who I'm a huge fan and is another person, even though he always, virtually always performed and wrote in an acoustic context. Uh, there was a period of those same electric jazz years where Keith Jarrett was a fellow traveler in the sort of the time of that period, but he was writing music that was strictly acoustic, right? And he had a an American group that were some of the, the guys who had all played with Ornette Coleman, and then he had simultaneously had a Scandinavian group with these fantastic little known musicians of the time from Sweden and Norway that were fantastic. And Keith wrote this incredibly uh, prolific body of music that was absolutely unique and is still, still inspirational and so distinctive that you hear a few bars even from somebody else's music and you go, that's, Keith, that's the Keith Jarrett thing. 
And strangely, uh, Keith Jarrett sort of renounced uh, jazz composition in a way. You know, at some point, <laughs> of all people, he said, no, jazz is about the improvisation. It's not about the compositions. After <laughs> having written, to me, kind of life-changing uh, original compositions of his own, well, you know, if, 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 <laughs> if anybody earned the right to say that, he did. You know, I don't, I don't agree. And, you know, I, I always missed his, uh, his phase when he was playing those beautiful original compositions of his. And then, uh, you know, uh, Winton obviously has had a huge effect in, uh, you know, a generation or two of jazz musicians now who are very devoted to the, um, the kind of the, the classic eras of jazz, you know, kind of that the 50s and, you know, kind of sneaking back into the 40s or 30s a little bit, I mean, the, the 60s, but uh, getting another generation of jazz performers uh, very deeply versed in that vocabulary. Um, I guess it, I, I, this is, I'm stepping outside my uh, typical university role of being um, sort of passing on the, the conventional wisdom. I think there's a, a, a possible danger if people only they think it's only valid, I'll take a sax player example, it's only valid if I'm playing like the great Sonny Stitt. Mm -hmm. And Sonny Stitt's music is universally, eternally fantastic. You know, he's the pinnacle of, or one of the pinnacles of bebop saxophone playing. But, you know, getting back to the subject of how do you make the music be a part of the times, if you find yourself on stage and uh, the rhythm section is playing kind of a hip hop beat, how do you bring Sonny Stitt into that conversation? It's not, it's, you know, it, that's, that's sort of the limit. To me, that's if you get too limited in time, especially in the past, or, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a musical problem. How do you deal with contexts that have been born after that time? How do you fit those things together? And there's also a kind of more practical one of how do you deal with your uh, contemporaries in, in the, not just your musician buddies, but the, the world in general. That's, uh, I, a lot of times when I'm sort of, I, I feel like because the, uh, influence of Wynton Marsalis has been so profound. When I get in a jazz history class to talking about the 70s, I have to kind of get on my, I always announce I'm about to get on my soapbox here. This is my opinion, you know, you don't have to agree with it and uh, at all, you know, you don't let, you know, you can feel free to disagree. But in my viewpoint, uh, the, some of the, that electric music of the 70s has been portrayed in retrospect, maybe by some people at the time, as some sort of, uh, oh, just kind of attempt to make some money and betray your principles and, uh, you know, like is, uh, you know, just uh, had nothing behind it. And I said, I know everybody here in this room, you guys are all great young players, and doesn't it gnaw at you a little bit that if you were to walk across campus and see people you know, then they would not relate to the music you're playing. You know, if you're playing a, a popular standard song from the 40s, unless they've heard it at a wedding or something, they don't know that song. The, the players that were originally using that as a vehicle to show their spontaneity, they were playing the common coin, you know, uh, Miles Davis playing My Funny Valentine. He wasn't playing some old jazz classic. He was playing a popular song that the man on the street knew the words to, right? And the way he played it, it's like, oh, you understand where he's, this unique place he's coming from because he's taken a familiar musical object and, you know, kind of reformed it for your entertainment or for your consideration. And to me, that's like, that's the... Uh, a problem that needs to be solved with if everything is a, if jazz can only be 
playing the, the great music of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, how are, are we trapping young musicians where they can't connect with the rest of their, the culture they're living in and the, you know, the people their age? And I don't know, some people may not think that's an issue. And sometimes, um, you know, a, a 21 year old jazz student may not think that's an issue by the time they become a little older <laughs> uh, it, it might start to matter to them a little bit. And I think, uh, so I, I, I put forth the theory at least that musicians like uh, like Miles Davis circa 1970, he, he wants to be a part of things. It's not just a uh, kind of a calculated money grab because there was no guarantee that that was gonna sell any records or anything. But hey, he was listening to Marvin Gaye and he was listening to James Brown and there's something about that that was new and exciting. And, you know, I felt he was wanting to connect <laughs> and not just kind of put a, uh, you know, an expired stamp on uh, his uh, his musicianship. So anyway, that's, I, I, I kind of relate to that and uh, sort of feel like I like to see the music kind of stay uh um, open. If 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 Times Ten is playing, uh, you know what we'd call fusion, it's not because man, I believe that the purpose here is to preserve the music of the '70s. It's more like I can't think of anything else because those guys made such a strong impression on me that it permeates my DNA. Well, that's, that's I think I think you've raised <laughs> some really profound points, Doctor Middle. Well, you, I, feel free to disagree. I know a lot of people do, so that's that's okay. And because I always go along with that because for, I can make all those pitches about what I find so valid and compelling about some styles of jazz or music that tend to be dismissed. But you know, I love playing in a you know nineteen uh, thirties bassy tribute big band, which I do once a year, and I love it, you know, or or if it's a situation where you're playing more traditional New Orleans jazz, it's like, yeah, you know, there's, I mean, I love all that stuff, and, you know, and I, I love playing on the various genres that border on, on jazz. Uh, I, I just flat out enjoy it, so, you know, I, I always have a hard time why people will understanding how people will dismiss certain things but whatever it is that they do love well i understand that completely because i love that music too well i thought but you've you've really put a high bar up saying that you need to learn that music of the 30s 40s and 50s and you need to find the standards of the day whether it's drake or christina aguilera or whatever you're doing there need to be uh jazz built on that scaffolding as well yeah, I think there's a sort of a code that comes if you're going to, you know, be, you know, it kind of gets to, you know, playing music. It's like, well, who's going to really judge you if some audience ignores you or nobody's there? You can't really, really worry about that. Ultimately, you're you are your own uh, umpire <laughs> musically. And that doesn't mean you kick yourself or punish yourself for not being better than you are. But you are aware of, you know, what's clicking and what's not and what needs work and. Uh, you know, I think a great getting back around to the Austin subject that I think even it, it certainly is true of Austin jazz, but if music in Austin in general is realizing how deep the musicianship is, and uh, you know, if you're playing, a, you know, a, a gig or just somehow playing music, recording, whatever it might be, with some musicians who are in another genre principally. Uh, the the way you connect is sort of trying to find that common ground and find where the music meets and find what as a jazz musician what you've have to offer how it enhances that music and uh, you want to because the people that are doing that singer songwriters or uh, blues musicians or uh, you know Latin musicians or whatever it might be they know that music at a very deep level the way that the jazz aficionados and specialists know those recordings. You'll find that musicians in those other genres have that same kind of level of perception and study and internalization of the music that speaks to them. So they're not just screwing around. They really, 
you know, they're, they're as deep and committed to it as anybody. And that kind of, you know, makes you want to be a part of their music in an effective way. And, you know, it's not just something just to be sort of dismissed or played with, you know, not really paying attention to the details. So I think that's really, thank you for that. That's really a gift to be able to hear those, uh, those perspectives. You know, I, uh, you know, I can, I can tell you a little bit about New Orleans jazz or Kansas City jazz or uh -huh. Chicago or West Coast or whatever. Is there, a, is there, is it even possible to think that there's an Austin sound or an Austin jazz sound? Well, there tends to be some. I mean, it's sort of morphed around, and you know the, you know one one of the Austin jazz sounds is sort of the the Western swing oriented thing, which you know was thanks to a bunch of musicians from Philadelphia. <laughs> Ray Benson is in his compatriots, you know, uh, and, but that's, you know, clearly they were, they were, they came here because there was a Texas connection in some of the music that had inspired, you know, Ray and his, in his uh, circle of musicians. Um, I think it's changed a lot over time and it's hard to say. I mean, I think jazz tends to be, you know, individualistic enough that, um, that there's always been a range of styles and players and some very distinct ones but you know i you know i think when it comes to jazz everybody tends to play jazz with a new york accent huh. of some kind you know uh um you know and i think the players here are not thinking about well what do we austin jazz musicians play or what do we texas jazz musicians play it's like no we're thinking about miles davis and Thelonious monk and charles mingus uh, you know like people do around the world you know you're i've had the opportunity to travel a good bit and you know you're in uh you know you know poland or something and you know those mus they're musicians you might bump into who have you know, who know those monk records better than you do, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, so that's become, I mean, it all kind of emanated out of New York over various decades, but that, ha that is the, essentially the jazz language of the world. And uh, very often musicians will sort of modify it to incorporate some aspect of, you know, whether it's South American or Asian or, you know, or some region of the U.S., some aspects of that body of music to improvise over or some kind of inherent regional dance rhythm or something. So people tend to give it a little bit of a twist, but I, I, I think there's a, uh, I think at least now that there's not much real uh, kind of regionalism to jazz, you know, I mean, thinking of like uh, Melissa Aldana from Santiago, Chile, or, uh, uh, you know, some of these, you know, Eastern European or Asian bebop, post-bop musicians, and even talking to them, it's like, they're like, oh yeah, well, I studied with you know, Bob Brookmeyer in New York for six months, you know, so it's, it's still, that's still the Mecca, you know, I mean, we're in weird times where it's hard to visit the Mecca for music right now, but I think that is the universal uh, influence. Well, Dr. Mills, I'm going to, so I've got, again, I'm going to just go with what you just said. We're just improvising a conversation here, uh -huh. which is good. Uh -huh. So, man, you've been here 50 years. You've been <laughs> it's part of the- frightening, isn't it? It's a lot, man. Yeah. And you've been here at the university. Uh, so I was going to go deeper into Austin, but I'm going to pivot a little bit out. So for a guy like you and me, who've been in a place for a long time, what are your dreams? What still, what are your dreams that you, that you aspire, the goals that you continue to set for yourself? Well, you're, I mean, you're always wanting to play the horn better than you did, or maybe it's just going to be differently, but you like to think it's better than you did uh, even a couple of days ago. <laughs> Sometimes I'm, uh, you know, kind of doing some recording project or something that's, and it's like, man, or I look at the charts and it's like, man, I don't quite trust the guy that wrote this a month ago. <laughs> he might not have known what he was doing. You know, I better, I better write something better. But, uh, you know, th there's just the music itself. There, there continues to be music coming from Austin, but, you know, coming from, from around the world that, Granted, there's a lot of stuff to sift through that's not much worth your time, but 
you know, as uh, sort of discouraged as you might get about the big picture of music or something, it's like, bingo, you hear somebody who's, you know, maybe, you know, it might be somebody who's 16 years old someplace in some other continent, or it might be somebody of your age or older who you just never had the chance to hear. And it's like, that's fantastic. It's like, this is like somebody I know, except they're doing it better. And um, so there's that. There's just, that's the power of the music itself, is that you never get all of it. Uh, I, I, I bumped into, had a chance to play like in a backing band for James Moody when he was in his early 80s. And, you know, just before the gig, he was, man, he was so excited. He was coming up to a, a sax players and check out this new lick I just, I just can't, you know, just found. I mean, that's, that's the kind of inspiration that somebody, that, that never gets old. Or you, um, you know, sometimes the, you know, there are things within the, um, the music business, you know, where there's not, you know, efforts and quality and rewards are not exactly <laughs> in any kind of a predictable relationship. And, you know, so, you know, you, you sort of develop a philosophy not to let that shake you too much, but ultimately it's the music itself that's so magical and so great, and uh, and that that will always be inspiring. Um, I, I think just the level of musicians around Austin has always been inspiring because, uh, again, jazz, but all those genres, new people coming with these incredibly high standards and dedications and uh you know you want to be kind of a part of that you know and kind of feel like you can sort of share in that energy and have something to, to contribute um so that's that's certainly inspiring just the the people who who play music you know it nobody who plays music is you know just kind of feels blase about music you know whatever style it is i mean that's it's the biggest part of their life and uh, you know it might be a different kind of music, but you certainly relate to that that feeling, and it's it's a great way to connect to people. Do you have any uh, not maybe not regrets, but do you have any sort of paths that you perhaps wish you had explored? Also, well, sometimes I you know like say in teaching you, you think because now a big part of my job is being a little more systematic about it and having a long term goal, and here's a short term goals to lead you to that long-term goal is kind of advice I try to give and I didn't have that at all <laughs> I was sort of wandering I would I had no early on I didn't have any vision of a life as a professional musician at all it just sort of you know the, the good fortune of things in Austin sort of opened that up as a possibility um, so um, where, where was I going you had a great question and I lost well, if you have any, you know, paths you wish you had explored. Oh. Or... So sometimes, you know, it crosses my mind as I'm woodshedding this. It's like, man, I got this thing together. <laughs> Too bad I wasn't doing this when I was 17. <laughs> and I waited till now to figure this out. But I think you, you can't really second guess those kind of experiences and, you know, just following the music that compelled you and reacting it to it that way, writing songs and so I can't look at any of that as a mistake. Um, I, I feel like I was extremely lucky to, uh, to have enough going on, enough connections in Austin that I stayed here, right? Uh, I, I feel like that was a good move as opposed to reg having moved to uh, another city with a maybe more uh, famous and daunting scene where, man, I you know, get discouraged and do some other line of work. I might have always wondered what would happen if I had stayed in Austin. And so uh, to the contrary of feeling like I missed out on something by, uh, you know, not moving to some other city, which was kind of a possibility. Uh, you know, I just sort of pondering it various time, you know, decades ago. But I think I was very lucky and fortunate or just or maybe just the benefit of uh, yeah, lucky laziness that I didn't leave town because so much came this way. And um, I always liked the idea of all the different kinds of opportunities I've been able to have in Austin 
I didn't have to declare myself this specialist or I do this thing to hang on with the niche in this scene. Austin sort of allowed me to move in a lot of different circles and that's been a, a very lucky uh, development that I couldn't have uh, calculated any better. It just sort of worked out lucky. So, as a, if you don't mind me saying, as an elder statesman, somebody who's established, mm -hmm. somebody, what advice would you have for a musician, not jazz musician necessarily, but a musician who's coming up, who might be looking at the landscape, uh, looking at the political landscape, and uh, looking at the economic landscape. What advice might you have for them to uh, to encourage them? Well, it's, there, I think everybody, first of all, you know, I mean, certainly young musicians now are in difficult times. And, you know, there have been, diff, you know, these are different difficult times, but difficult times are a part of uh, history and music history, too. And it's important to keep doing what you want to do figure out a way to convey that and share that with your fellow musicians in Austin or elsewhere around the world. Right now, it happens to be uh, getting, you know, feeling fluent in Zoom and, you know, a kind of a recording situation, things you can do from home. You can still exchange your ideas even while you're waiting to play gigs. You can be honing your craft. There will be music on the other side. We don't know exactly what shape it might take. Some venues may come or go, but um, you know, if you if you play music right, people are going to still have an interest in it. And uh, so, uh, don't don't you know, kind of keep working through that. And uh, you, you, no matter what, whether whether it's boom times or bust times you always have to be your own motivator and you always have to be your own teacher <laughs> those that that's kind of a constant right and so uh you know i i you know i got a little bit frustrated despite my sort of uh you know my urgings or whatever attempts at inspirational speeches or whatever students who feel like ah oh, you know the you know there are, the jam sessions are happening so i'm not really motivated to practice and you know my uh, after having given sympathy, <laughs> my my next thing is you know so you were only going to the uh, jam sessions to impress people or only because so people would you know clap for you or whatever you know what if you're on a desert island with the good fortune to be on a desert island with a working saxophone and in reeds and stuff would you not even open the case because there's nobody to applaud for you or is just getting on that horn and making those sounds is that rewarding on its own and maybe the most rewarding thing you can imagine and that's so <laughs> try to put it in that in that space you know where uh, you kind of create your own reward system and um, and that I think that is sort of you know bulletproof against economic up and down and, you know, a lot of other, you know, difficulties we're going through right now. So can you tell us what might be a project that you're, you're working on or a book that you're reading or something that you, that you're thinking about now? Well, I, 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 I when I read books, uh, I, I should, it's really language facility exercise. I read books in, uh, in other languages uh, not because they're profound and material, but because I love the language itself, and it's a way of inf reinforcing that. But uh, that's kind of my aside. But in terms of musical projects, oh, I have some uh, some kind of jazz chamber music projects going on. I'm, you know, I'm writing uh, music for jazz or borderline jazz groups, uh, large and small. I'd say. Of the stuff I write, maybe one tenth of it gets performed someplace. You know, I kind of, I mean, it's not all great. <laughs> so I kind of pick and choose, but I'm always writing stuff for, for all kinds of projects. I'm writing projects, uh, music for other people. I'm doing, you know, string and horn section arrangements for people. Um, I have a, a recording that's waiting to come out that uh, was. A collaboration with a really wonderful poet out of New York, who, named Cornelius Eady, who I took a lot. Uh, he, 
you, you offered up a selection of his poems with kind of some common themes. Actually, very often interesting stories about blues or jazz figures of the past. Super insightful and wonderful use of language and thought. And, you know, I, I built uh, jazz scores around those. And uh, so that's, that's a project that's in the can, but not, not quite out. Um, uh, you know, I'd say I'm writing some kind of, uh, I mean, in the last couple of months, I've written a new string quartet and I, I, I write for strings and it, it, there's always some kind of hidden jazz element. I'm not, I'm not making it swing, but somewhere in there, there's some Herbie or, 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 or Wayne Short or somebody, you know, mixed in with maybe the Stravinsky and Ravel. Well, that's bringing it all the way back to Charles Mingus, right? He used to do something similar, I would imagine. Yeah, so I love writing all those different directions, and I'm always writing new uh, things for the the big bands at UT. You know, I, I've been there 20 years now, and I've written about 80 uh, big band charts. Some of time, sometimes I will I'll grab some of that and use it with uh, times 10. But generally speaking, put one of those things together, and there's one cool concert. At UT, and that music is never heard or played again. It's very, uh, <laughs> it's very fleeting. But you know, that's that's what history's for, isn't it? I, I love, I just love the writing process. Even though there's a kind of a timeline of inspiration and sheer joy, till oh wow, there's some work involved in finishing this. <laughs> you got to see it through the end. It's easy to get excited and get it started, finishing it out, getting all those last details. And, you know, there, there's definitely a, you know a, a steep incline of effort, but I've, I've been over that hump so many times. I kind of know what's coming, and I uh, kind of get used to it. Sure. Well, since you brought it up, what languages do you speak, or do you read in, or do you want to? Well, yeah, I I, I speak German well, and you know I studied it formally and have a degree in it. And anytime I'm in that part of the world. Uh, you know, I, I continue to study it and use it, and, but you know, I have a a, a functional uh, abilities, especially when I've revved myself up for some travels in uh, Italian and French and Spanish, and I, uh, I was in Belgium a summer before last, and I was studying Dutch and Belgium, and I just I like that process. I actually find when I'm uh, use you know really exercising that part of the brain for that language and like an improviser getting all that kind of the kind of the content and the organization and getting ready to really <laughs> come out at the spur of the moment you know extremely parallel to uh, to jazz improvisation. Well, that's actually where I was going to go. That's uh, thank you for for bringing that point up because I, I agree with you. Yeah, it's and it has very much the same kind of study process. Oh, you kind of study structures, vocabulary. It's not good. I mean, you need to listen to it, but that's not enough. You need to get it to come out actively. And, it, you know, you have to practice getting it out actively. And in performance situations, it's very much like, oh, I... I can speak. I can. I can express myself in French, not very, not uh, grammatically perfectly or phonetically perfectly, but I can. You know, if I need to say something, I know how to say it. But you know, in conversation, it's more like, well, yeah, but can you play giant steps up to tempo? And that's kind. Of, and that's kind of what everyday conversation is in, in another language. It's like they're burning through giant steps, and you can go. Oh yeah, I, I heard the changes and I recognize that line, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I can't. It's going by too fast for me to react to it. So it, it's very parallel, and including the part where you need to be willing to, at whatever level you're in there, get in there and hang as well as you can, and know that at some point you're going to fall down and and laugh it off and come back for more. You know, because that's about the only way you can learn it. So, you know, I've. I've Keep, you're always going through that. You have good days and bad days, and uh, something that you learned a year ago, if if you haven't been practicing, it's going to kind of fade away. Never takes as much time to get it back once you had it. But you, you know, it's sort of you always have to. At least I always have to dust it off, right? It, it's not just some automatic thing. It's like very uh, sort of a deliberate process. And another parallel 
with languages is you try to operate within what you can do in that language. Sort of like if I'm trying to take a piano solo, I can kind of, I know where things are at the piano, but I'm not particularly fluid or, you know, that's not what I do at the piano. So if I'm going to, in a weird spot where, oh, I'm supposed to take a solo because I'm at the piano at this jam session, it's like, okay, what can I do with the means I have as opposed to attempting the same kind of thing I would play on the saxophone and not being able to do it? I'm trying to manage my more limited uh, skill set. And it's very much like that in, in other languages. I, I think that's a wonderful parallel and I appreciate that. And I appreciate your time. And do you, Dr. Mills, do you have anything that you wanted to add or ask or, or, or present? Well, I, I, I mean, I'd just like to certainly thank the Austin Jazz Society for all they do and ha having had the good fortune to be here all these years. And I think about the, the people that uh, the society have honored over the years, it's like, wow, that's my life. Those are all the people that I spent all those great years playing with. And, you know, that they, those people and their music uh, meant a lot to me. And it means a lot to me that the Austin Jazz Society is, you know, to be a part of it and to, uh, you know, sort of share that, that, you know, living history with, with all those people and those, you know, the players and the audiences. So anyway, I'm just sort of honored to be and that uh, select group of wonderful people. Well, it's a delight to speak with you and thank you so much for your perspectives and your presence. And I offer you blessings for good health and for continued inspiration. Thank you very much, Rabbi Neil. I appreciate the opportunity. Mm -hmm.